Good evening. It's the first day of phase two. People are out and so are our colleagues. They have been checking out the situation at shopping malls, restaurants and even the gyms. We'll bring you those stories in just a moment. Thanks for joining us on The Big Story with Olivia Kui. I'm Harianto Diman. Now remember to subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Now, the Health Ministry confirmed one coronavirus case in the community among the 142 new cases today. It involved a prison inmate on a social visit pass. The Ministry said he had been segregated from the general inmate population since his admission to Changi Prison Complex on June 6 and was tested positive for the virus. Migrant workers living in dormitories formed the remaining cases. Today's count brings the total cases in Singapore to 41,615. By all accounts, people were relatively cautious this morning as Phase 2 kicked in. There wasn't a mad rush for tables at eateries and even at popular stalls at Bukit Timah Market and in Coburn Hawker Centres, most patrons were opting for takeaways. But can the same be said of shopping malls? Multimedia journalist Rene Po files this report from Waterway Point in Punggol Central. From Orchard Road to the Heartlands, shopping malls were buzzing with activity on the first day of Singapore's Phase 2 reopening. It is just past 10 a.m. at Waterway Point where the mall has opened for business. Even before opening, a queue of about 50 people had already formed outside the main entrance. Shoppers entered in an orderly manner, scanning the safe entry QR code to check in. And as you can see behind me, there is a long line of people waiting to get inside Daiso as well. Those I spoke to told me that they were out and about to buy essential items. I want to get like, pay, uh, like paper wipes and like I feel like it's much more cheaper option in Daiso than compared to other supermarkets. So I don't mind queuing. Not so much because it's the first day of phase two, uh, but because I needed to get groceries. Actually, we can wait till tomorrow, but uh, I was thinking that like, maybe everybody's working today so we can just come out today and then just get our stuff. So over the weekend, we can just sit at home. Shoppers also said that they were careful about practicing safety measures. I think I will avoid um, hanging out around outside too long for now. So you can see right now I'm wearing a mask. So um, uh, each time I try to sanitize my hands, I'm still taking the option of dying, taking out uh, because um, you know uh, this virus is can't be seen. So I'm just taking the necessary precautions. And uh, as much as we can, not to talk. <laughs> so I think uh, if everyone do their part, it, it should help. A spokesperson from mall operator Fraser's Property Retail which manages Waterway Point, said that tenants have been cooperative about getting their shops ready for reopening. We have been engaging and working very uh, closely with all our retailers in the mall to make sure that they, they do uh, carry out all the necessary cleaning and disinfecting work to provide a safe environment for our shoppers. The tenants are, are quite supportive and they are quite cooperative. Under Phase 2 rules, retail establishments must adhere to strict occupancy limits, do frequent cleaning of common areas and implement the safe entry visitor check-in system. At Spectacle chain own days, several walk-in customers were seen in the store, which previously only took appointments during the circuit breaker period. The prop is actually increased drastically. Because I'm staying nearby, so most of the time I came here, uh, I can see the crowd is actually triple, triple out. Triple as compared to circuit, circuit breaker. <laughs> So when there's number of customers in the store, more than 20, we will actually temporarily limit the entry into the store. We do anticipate the number of shoppers will increase uh, because more shops will now be open. So we will also be progressively opening up more entrances and exit to ensure a smoother flow of traffic uh, into the malls. Uh, so this is still uh, at the early stage. We will continue to monitor this and adjust the, the site. Yeah. Uh, condition uh, according to the to the crowd. The first day of phase two seems to have gotten off to a smooth start with a sizable crowd returning to shopping malls. Retailers are looking forward to welcoming more shoppers over the weekend and are ready to do so while following strict safety measures. At the same time, shoppers are generally cautious not to linger longer than necessary under what is now Singapore's new normal. Renee Poe for The Straits Times. 
Let's cross live to Dylan Ang, who's in the heart of Orchard Road right now. Dylan, you've been there for a couple of hours. How does it feel being out and about? And what is it like in Orchard Road? Yes, I'm here uh, at Paragon, right in the heart of Orchard Road to observe what the streets are like. It is, of course, uh, the first day of Singapore's Phase 2 of reopening after about 11 weeks of circuit breaker and Phase 1 measures to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, in terms of crowd, uh, there is certainly more crowd here uh, than during the circuit breaker where people were told to stay at home uh, and only leave their homes for essential services. Uh, but definitely nowhere close to uh, the pre-COVID days uh, and when Orchard Road is always teeming with life. Uh, I think if there's one word to describe what I'm seeing here, uh, that word would be excited. I think people look to be very excited to be out and about with their friends and families. Uh, but they are keeping to the, uh, uh, the group of five rule. Uh, here at Paragon, for example, uh, there is a steady stream of uh, customers. Uh, I visited a couple of other malls in the, the region. Uh, and they are all uh, seeing a similar trend. Uh, 313 Somerset, though, uh, has a bit of a line to go in. And uh, surprisingly, I don't see many active lines outside retail shops or restaurants. Uh, if there is, it's probably you know, fewer than five people. Uh, but I do see quite a number of people uh, walking around. Uh, and every mall I go to, uh, I think all the shops are very uh, ready for reopening. Every mall I go to has implemented safe entry at all entrances and all exit points. Uh, and in fact, uh, when, I, when, I, when I myself went in, you know, I had to show the security guard proof that I actually had entered my details uh, before being allowed to go in and go out. Excellent. Do you know why people are flocking to the malls? We've seen pictures of crowds at uh, Takashimaya, for instance. So what did some of these shoppers tell you? Yeah, so I spoke to a couple of people earlier and everyone has kind of shared this, a similar sentiment. A lot of them said that they've been feeling very cooped up at home after so many weeks of very strict measures uh, and are very excited to actually regain uh, a sense of normalcy again. A lot of them uh, actually told me that they, they were very relieved when the government said uh, that phase two was going to commence and that uh, they can actually go out in groups of five. A lot of people were saying that they were, you know, looking forward to, you know, this, uh, this group of five going out in groups uh, much more than actually dining in at uh, restaurants or even visiting uh, retail shops. Hmm. Dylan, can you share with us more on the demographics of the people that you're seeing right now? Do you see uh, more young couples out and about or do you see families or do you see groups of friends? Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, I'm seeing mostly young people here. I don't see that many uh, elderly people out and about. Uh, I see a lot of young couples. I see young families. Uh, I see groups of friends as well. Uh, I spoke to uh, a young couple earlier who was actually out and about with their two-year-old daughter. Uh, and I, when I asked them, you know, are you guys worried about um, any risk of, uh, of COVID, uh, of, you know, of the spread of COVID-19? Uh, some of them were saying that they were not very worried because they feel that the current precautions are already enough and uh, even if and they said that they want to worry about their daughter as well now of course uh, retail and F&B outlets uh, aren't the only things reopening of course uh, sports facilities got the green light from the government to go uh, to begin their operations as well now our colleague multimedia uh, journalist Kimberly Zhao actually visited uh, some gyms earlier today and caught up with some gym goers let's take a look Sports facilities reopened their doors today as Singapore enters phase two of its reopening. And at Safra Pongo's Energy One gyms, crowds of people were waiting outside the premises to begin their workouts even before their opening. I look forward to training again. I've been doing a lot of home workouts, but it's not effective as uh, coming to the gym. And uh, I think my body is quite overdue for a good workout. Very excited to use the, 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 the gym. I, I feel that it's very safe. Uh, Safra has all the, the safety measures in place. And, but of course, as individuals, I think we also have to do our own uh, social responsibility. Uh, wipe down the equipment after use. Uh, make sure you use your towels. And uh, don't congregate too much. Maintain a minimum space of about 1 meter to 2 meters. Yep, I think, I think everybody will be fine. In terms of before the circuit breaker and the reopening day like today, uh, in comparison in the morning crowd, I can see there is an increase in crowd. We are excited to welcome the members back. We are prepared for the gym opening and put, uh, put in place measures to safeguard the welfare and well-being of our members. At this point of time, we shouldn't have any body contact 
and uh, in order to support the mistakes or to amend the form of the exercises we will maintain a uh, one meter distancing so as to uh, carry on these instructions and make the form perfect for them Sports facilities given the green light to reopen include stadiums, swimming complexes, sports halls, hard courts, gyms, fitness studios and bowling centres. Over at Legends Fight Sport, boxing classes have gone from group and private classes to private classes only. When we do personal coaching, we can control the crowd that's coming to the gym. We make sure that they don't interact with each other and we can control the temperature taking, contact tracing. But for the group classes, we are still thinking of how to benefit the existing membership because previously we just put the membership on hold first so now we're going to see uh, how we can like make them still benefit from the gym membership even though they're not coming to the gym i think this covid situation is going to change the fitness industry for sure but as a business person business owner i think it's important to learn all the changes and adapt to survive the first day of Phase 2 reopening has seen gym goers excited to return to their workout routines and operators, for now, seem to be taking the enhanced safety measures in their stride. Thank you, Kim, Dylan and Renee for bringing us those reports. Now on to other news. A new study by the National Centre for Infectious Diseases found that the ability of COVID-19 patients to contaminate their environment with the virus peaks during the first week of their illness, but falls significantly afterwards. Based on the study, NCID said that there is no need to discriminate against or avoid discharged COVID-19 patients as they no longer shed the virus. The study also found some particles of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 were small enough to potentially spread like an aerosol. But NCID said this finding alone is insufficient to prove that the virus is airborne as the viability of the virus in the air will need to be proven. From next month, union members aged 40 and above will receive more support to upgrade their current skills and learn new ones. They can use up to $500 a year to defray up to half of the out-of-pocket expenses for course fees. Younger workers will still get $250 a year. The higher funding level applies until the end of 2022 and it can be used on 5,300 courses listed on the NTUC website. More religious activities will be allowed to gradually resume at places of worship. From next week, congregational and other worship services with up to 50 people at a time can resume. Singing and other live performances, however, will not be permitted during the service and there should not be any sharing of prayer or other common items. The organisations need to draw up a safe management plan that would, among other things, ensure that worshippers keep one metre apart. The plan needs to be approved by the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth before the services can be held. Other religious activities aside from cong congregational and worship services are also allowed to take place concurrently. But these are subject to a cap of 50 people and should be conducted at separate locations within the place of worship. Other non-congregational religious activities such as religious rites, pastoral services and religious classes can also be conducted for groups of up to five people. Now, earlier this week, Minister for the Environment and Water Resources Masago Zukifli told the Straits Times that despite having a secure method of diversifying food imports, Singapore needs to build its own sustainable food system, and efforts to increase local farming areas can be expected. Mr Masagos added that addressing climate change is just as important as battling COVID-19 and reminded Singaporeans to maintain the current standards of hygiene and safe distancing during Phase 2. Here are the highlights from his interview with science and environment correspondent Audrey Tan. To uh, be able to interact safely, not only for themselves but also for others and leave the table clean and hygienic, in a hygienic condition for others, including the cleaners. We want to uh, enable the, the cleaners to focus on keeping table surfaces clean and not also uh, clearing up after us after we eat. We may even resort to regulations. We may even resort to uh, beyond exhortation, uh, premise owners, uh, operators and so forth. We have to see how, how, things, how things evolve. 
But most importantly, I hope though that uh, we embrace this understanding how it affects our public health as well as how it affects people around us. So I think our work, our work compassion, our, our care for, for the environment as well for others should be driving this and not regulations. I mean, beyond hygiene, COVID-19 um, has brought up a few other issues, including food security for Singapore, which imports more yes. than 90% of our food. So can you just tell us a bit more about Singapore's um, food resilience strategies? Um, diversification has long been a pillar of our food security. Yes. So does the pandemic, has it brought up any new lessons for us? Today, we are, we are, we are importing from more than 170 countries and regions, which means that if one region gets affected uh, because of some disease among the, in, in the animals or in the farms, we can get supply from somewhere else. But this pandemic uh, situation create, created situations which we, I, I would think, have never in our lifetime thing would happen. For example, in the countries where are producing food, they get worried about their own food security and uh, calls for restricting food exports uh, cause uh, some important uh, food items, maybe like rice or even flour, to, to rise. In the meantime, where they are being, uh, where they're supposed to be exported from, uh, they have not taken care of the storage and uh, food just get wasted. And this, has, this, if you put it together over a long period of time, can cause price fluctuations, uh, supply disruption. And we therefore uh, have been thinking about uh, what uh, we have to do uh, to, to tackle this, which is why the 30 by 30 uh, vision that we wanted to, to implement, producing 30% of nutritional needs in, by 2030, we now call it 30 by 30 Express to do it immediately, launch it fast and hope to see the results within six months to uh, 24 months. Some of these uh, supplies are essentials, whether they are eggs, vegetables or fish. Uh, some of them can be done even now because we can further diversify or even bring the farms in. Uh, they are almost kind of uh, fixed, uh, ready to fix up and, 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 and produce. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, it is not something we can wait for 10 years or, or 20 years to, to implement. But I think one important question that many of us have in our minds is, will food prices go up the further we be import from? Well, in the situation that we are facing right now, food prices can go up from, for many reasons. And one of them is when there's a constraint in supply, the uh, group of people who are actually in a position to control the prices, they too can raise the price. So you want to have a situation where supply is not disrupted because that also uh, gives us the security of, of uh, food on our shelves. Uh, at the same time, uh, you want to sort of uh, mitigate the possible price increases. We'll do all we can to make sure that the prices are affordable and that the food supplies are accessible. So earlier this year during the budget debates, your ministry mentioned um, the possibility of increasing farming in the new Tew area and also the potential of expanding more aquaculture zones in the southern Singapore streets. So I was wondering whether you could give us any update, you know, now that food security is so important. Well, there is both the long-term and the short-term view on this. Uh, the short-term view is to uh, fund what we call 30 by 30 Express. Uh, innovations that are already existing that can now be put to practice. Uh, we've got many, many responses and uh, I'm very happy because uh, it, can, it allows us to quickly scale up our local production uh, almost tenfold. So that's where the excitement really is about. Uh, that will also then fit into a future and a longer term uh, view. Uh, we already have talked about the uh, AFIP and then now we'll also look at Lim Chukang. How do we integrate Lim Chukang into the whole food belt so that uh, it is not just a place where you produce food locally, it's also a place for innovation to show, uh, to put in R&D ideas, a place where we can also implement uh, uh, zero waste uh, concepts, where the waste from one part of the industry can be used by another part of the industry. Some of these uh, innovations uh, are in, in areas of like uh, veg vegetable uh, growing. What they need now actually is uh, new areas and we are, we are now releasing MSCP, the car park rooftops that now can be used for them and, and give them more space to produce this vegetable. And because they are 
produced close to where they are consumed, it means that these vegetables are fresh, uh, they are uh, pest, pest free. At the same time, because it's very close to where they are, they are produced, they last longer. Uh, inevitably, also, you can also say that uh, very low carbon footprint. You know, um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the annual United Nations conference that was supposed to be held in the UK at the end of this year has been postponed to next year. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, the conferences may be postponed, the, the meetings may be postponed, but climate change is continuing. And uh, one part of climate change we, we must always worry about, particularly for Singapore, uh, is uh, sea level rise. And the way, the way sea level rise is not something that can be disrupted because we did something differently. It is something that happens in a very slow way, uh, sometimes accelerated by industrial activities. Uh, but stopping those industrial activities will not reverse this uh, sea level rise immediately, which is why uh, we have to be ready and continue to uh, fortify, in, make our uh, coastal protection better over the years. In the meantime, we must uh, contribute to the uh, uh, fight against climate change. So for example, in Singapore, we have uh, enhanced our NDC. We have also submitted our long-term emission goals and uh, revised it to peak at uh, 65 megaton by 2030 and halve it by 2050 and then aim for neutral uh, net zero emission in the second half of the century. And there are technologies which have uh, been proven in concept but not in scale but there are also promises in future where you, you, you would be able to solve hopefully the problems that you are facing today. I'll give you two examples. One is carbon capture. We can actually capture the carbon and then sequester it and then prevent it from polluting and causing the uh, climate change problem we have today. But over the longer term, there are other alternatives. For example, hydrogen. I, I personally feel uh, hydrogen would be the ultimate uh, goal we should really be going for. Uh, although it is a dangerous uh, uh, element to keep in our home, uh, to store in our home, but then again, even petrol is quite dangerous to put near your house, right? If, you, if your car is parked near your home. But today, you, we, we are able to put it in a safe, contained situation where you don't even think about it exploding in your house, right? So hydrogen can go that way too. Do you think that all these technologies could improve um, to the extent that we might be able to meet the net zero by 2050 recommendation? Um, in Singapore or do you think it's still... Uh, we better push those boundaries because uh, it is not a, only a question of uh, something academic uh, to put to, to nice, something nice to do. It will affect our food supply, it will affect our, our coastal uh, sea level, it will also affect uh, the weather. So it is as disruptive as COVID-19. We have arrived at phase two only because we cooperated, we collaborated to uh, observe safe distancing. Many of us, in fact, most of us stayed home, uh, observe uh, this distancing even, even when we go out to get food. Uh, now that we have achieved this uh, wonderful outcome, uh, we don't want that to then change into a situation where uh, we have to do the circuit breaker again. I don't think we can afford it. Um, therefore, it is still important for us to observe safe distancing even when we are now allowed to eat with our friends, five of us together, and you know we don't put masks when we when we are eating with each other. Observe uh, the DIDs, uh, distant the, the density, how how many people should be around, and don't go beyond that five right now. Uh, the intensity, how long you are uh, talking to each other and eating with each other and uh, interacting with each other. So although you will be missing your friend, uh, please don't stay on for two hours, three hours reminiscing how we are missing each other for eight weeks. Do it in 20 minutes, eat, meet and go. And that's, that goes for when even when you visit your relatives and your friends, uh, their homes, don't stay too long because these are exactly why and how the virus uh, can spread. Thank you, Minister, for joining us today. Thank you. And that was Environment and Water Resources Minister Masago Zukifli. You can watch the full interview on the Straits Times YouTube channel.
the global headlines, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the U.S.'s leading government expert on COVID-19, said the country doesn't need more widespread lockdowns to get the outbreak under control. This despite the virus now increasing in 20 states, creating a plateau in the national case graph. Dr. Fauci stressed that a localized approach would be required instead. He also expressed optimism in the search for a vaccine, calling early trial results encouraging. American Airlines removed a passenger who refused to wear a face covering and has banned him from taking flights in the future. The company said Mr. Brandon Strucker won't be allowed to fly on American Airlines until face coverings are no longer required. The ban validates a warning U.S. Airlines made this week, vowing increased vigilance in requiring the wearing of masks. According to American Airlines, Mr. Strucker boarded his flight from New York's LaGuardia Airport with a face covering but later took it off. When asked whether he had a medical condition, he replied that he didn't. Mr. Strucker, a conservative activist with about 400,000 followers on Twitter, posted a video saying he had been kicked off his flight for not wearing a mask. He also accused the airline's employees of intimidating him. Despite authorities concluding that imported salmon likely wasn't responsible for spreading the recent COVID-19 outbreak in Beijing, the food has been virtually boycotted in the city. Within a few days of the new outbreak, salmon was removed from major supermarket shelves in Beijing, reserves for the fish were dumped and bulk orders were stopped. Diners have also cancelled reservations at Japanese restaurants in the Chinese capital, while salmon suppliers around the world are trying to salvage the tarnished reputation of their prized product. Life as we know it will no longer be the same as Singapore transitions to a new normal post-circuit breaker. To inspire and uplift readers during these unprecedented times, The Straits Times commissioned 30 works by local writers and artists on the COVID-19 pandemic and what it will look like when all this is over. This was done with the support of the National Arts Council as part of the hashtag SG Culture Anywhere campaign. It's day 10 into the series and today's piece is a song titled Autumn by the Xiongling Musical Association. Autumn is a song in the Nyanyin tradition. Nyanyin means southern music in Chinese and it is an ancient musical tra tradition that dates back more than 2,000 years to the Han Dynasty. Let's take a listen to the song. We're now joined by the man himself, Xiao Mingxian, who came up with the song Autumn. Now, he's the general manager of Xiong Ling Musical Association. Mingxian, for a start, tell us more about the song Autumn. What does it signify? Hello, everyone. Uh, 
basically the song or term is actually part of our production. Uh, it's called Cicada Zen. So it was first staged in Esplanade in 2012. So in summary, the production actually tries to portray the life cycle of men in relation to the four seasons. So in this video where we, where we present Autumn this song, it actually features the sound of the different nine instruments. And it is also incorporated with the Malay Kongpang, Chong Ran, and various uh, percussion instruments to actually evoke the joys of Autumn. So uh, for the musicians, we actually hope the song uh, it will be able to actually take the listeners to a place of calm and new beginnings, as well as serve as a motivation to actually embrace the changes and transformation that will come in the following months. Mm. But Ning Xian, with everyone stuck at home, how did you manage to put the song together? Yeah, it was quite hard uh, and a challenge at first because we, we are not able to actually meet up for rehearsals. So what we did is uh, we actually do um, Zoom calls where we rehearse online. But uh, sometimes there's a delay in, in terms of the sound and visual, so we try to actually record it, pre-record it, and actually send to one another to actually practice. So what we did was uh, we actually applied for a time limit, uh, time exemption to actually come back to our office because you know most of our instruments and uh, audio rec recording equipment are actually in the office. So um, when we came back to the office, we tried to stagger um, the musicians so that we don't have more than five at, at one time. Yeah. Yeah, Undoubt undoubtedly, uh, Ming Sen, the COVID-19 situation has affected the way you bring your music to the audience as well. You can no longer stage live performances, but that hasn't stopped uh, the association from promoting the art form. How have you coped with these changes? Do you see these changes helping to reach out to more segments of the society? So actually, before the COVID-19 situation, we were often busy planning and staging live performances. So, you know, while the circuit breaker, it actually provides us an opportunity to actually reflect on our strategies on how to bring learning to our audiences. So what we did is uh, we tried to go, we tried to digitalize most of our past productions. So we uploaded that in, onto our Facebook and it actually helped us create more exposure as our video actually reached out to a wider international audience from Taiwan, United States and South Korea. Of course, you know, the intimacy and connection between a live performance and a live audience can, can never be replaced, but we have to adapt and try our best to bring our art form to everyone during this period of time. Right. Well, at this moment, uh, Ming Xian, as an artist, as a performer, what do you miss most about your work? Uh, I believe all of us actually miss the interaction that we have with our audiences and also our fe mm. fellow musicians. You know, while performing Nanning is all about the harmony and camaraderie of, among the musicians. So we used to meet like one to two times a week, you know, before COVID-19 to actually practice and jam music. So we kind of miss that at times. Mm, well said. Uh, thank you, Ming Sien, so much for spending some time with us here today. We were speaking to Xiao Ming Sien, the General Manager of Xiong Ling Musical Association. The group produced the song Awesome as part of the 30 Days of Art with NAC series and you can find out more information on the series and see the other works at this Straits Times website. The Progress Singapore Party said it will try to avoid three-cornered fights for the next general election but stressed that no party has the right to tell others where to go. Party chief Tan Cheng Bok said that no one has the power to say that they don't want a particular party to contest in a particular area and added that in the same vein, parties cannot prevent others from wanting to contest against them. The PSP has overlapping claims with four parties that are intending to form a bloc, namely the People's Progressive Party, Reform Party, Singaporeans First and the Democratic Progressive Party. Singapore's newest party, Red Dot United, also said today that it will not contest any constituency should there be a three-cornered fight. The party has its sights on Jurong GRC, but said it will do so only if other opposition parties do not field candidates there. RDU also unveiled a red and white compass as its logo. New satellite images show increased Chinese activity in the days leading up to the most violent border clash between India and China in decades have emerged. 
The images were shot on Tuesday, a day after the clash that led to the death of 20 Indian soldiers. They revealed that China had brought in pieces of machinery, cut a trail into a Himalayan mountainside and may have even dammed a river. India claims that the attack was premeditated and came at a time when top commanders had agreed to defuse tensions on the line of actual control or LAC on the disputed and poorly defined border between the nuclear armed neighbours. China have rejected the allegations and blamed frontline Indian soldiers for provoking the conflict. Colgate Palmolive said yesterday that it was working to review and evolve toothpaste brand Dali, the latest in a string of brand reassessments amid a U.S. debate on racial inequality. Dali is a Chinese brand owned by Colgate and its joint venture partner Howley & Hazel. Its package features a smiling man in a top hat. Its previous name was Darky and featured a man in blackface. That said, its current Chinese name still translates to black person toothpaste. Colgate said that it is working with partners to review and further evolve all aspects of the brand, including the brand name. The company's statement followed news that PepsiCo had decided to drop its Aunt Jemima logo over similar concerns. Before we go, just a reminder, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Heng Swee Kit will be delivering the final national broadcast tomorrow at 7.30pm. You can watch his address on our Facebook, YouTube and Twitter pages. Those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, do visit straightsimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kuei. Thanks for joining us on The Big Story. Have a good weekend and see you next week.